Welcome to the Stone Choir Podcast. I am Corey J. Mahler. And I'm still woe. On today's Stone Choir, we're going to begin the first of what will be at least a three-part series on the Jews. As I said last week, towards the end of the episode, in the next few weeks, we're going to get, be getting into some stuff that will probably cross some red lines for some people, probably make some of you uncomfortable. The reason that we're tackling it is that that's a problem. The fact that someone simply saying the Jews may have made you squirm, maybe you turned down the volume a little bit, that's a big deal because that came from somewhere. And as Christians, we can't talk about our own religion without talking about the Jews. There's no way to talk about the history of the faith without talking about these people. The ethnicity, the religious beliefs, the history are all relevant to us today, both in time and in the current year. And so the fact that there's this sort of inherent recoiling that I think has been put in, in many of our hearts to even hear the word, you sort of flinch and think something's, something bad's going to happen. I, I don't want to be here anymore. That's not an adult response. That, that's not something that should be the case. And so today and over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be going through the history of the Jews in terms of scripture, in terms of post-scriptural history, and then modern history, things that some of the things have happened in living memory. This first episode is going to be entirely focused around scripture, so we're going to be begin in the garden, and we're going to take it all the way through the end, and then, you know, obviously the Bible basically ends with some prophecies and the destruction of the temple. We're going to be talking about some a few post-temple destruction events that are relevant to some of the points we're going to make today, but for the most part, this will be ending right around the second century. The episode is going to be in three distinct parts. They'll sort of flow into each other because we're going to do this in chronological order. The first part, the first third, will be basically the timeline of, you know, from Adam through Noah to Abraham, through Moses to Jesus. When did the Jews appear? What did they do? How did they act? What was promised to them? What was commanded to them? How did they respond to all those things? That basically tend, takes us to the roughly the end of the Old Testament, which is also called the intertestamental period. There are some things that happened in that time frame uh, from, the, from the conquering of the northern, northern kingdom through the birth of Christ that I think some Christians who know a little bit know some bits and pieces, but I think we're going to put some of those details together in a way that will actually make sense for why we talk about things like, for example, the Septuagint. Why is there a Greek Old Testament that's relevant? So the second part is going to be the fact that many of you would probably recognize the Hebrew language. If you saw it written, you see a picture, and you're like, yeah, it's Hebrew. What you don't know is that that's not Hebrew. <laughs> that is, it's an Aramaic script, and it's a language that is disconnected from the original language of the Israelites. And so we're going to talk about what happened in that time period and why it's relevant today that we have these these confusions about what happened in the past, because some of the claims that we're trying to disabuse in this episode are that when someone today says, I am a Jew, and I speak Hebrew, and I live in Israel, those are all words from the Bible, and those are therefore borrowing whatever affections we have as Christians for our connection to those words in the Bible. And the reason for going over some of the history is that there is a not only a profound discontinuity between what we have and what we see and what we hear today and what was happening thousands of years ago, but the discontinuity is the result of God's judgment against those people. And that's what makes it a profoundly important religious matter. This is, this is a matter of the faith. When God pronounces judgment upon people and they're scattered and destroyed, Every nation is to take that as a warning. Whenever there's any sort of calamity that befalls someone, that should be taken as a warning that this is God's judgment. They did something bad, whatever it was, I should pay attention. I should not do the bad thing that they did. So it's important to learn you know, from everything in Scripture, when God visits his wrath, let's make sure that doesn't happen to us too. And that might involve not listening to the people to whom God's wrath was poured out by the bucket load. So the second part will be the intertestamental period and the, the fiction of the Hebrew language. And the third part is going to specifically deal with 
the time of Christ in the New Testament as he was preaching, as he was going around in Judea and Samaria. What did he encounter and how did the Jews treat him? One of the overarching themes of, of all three of these sections is that we're going to be saying many things that your pastors probably are afraid to say. And in some cases, your pastors don't know. I've had pastors who literally didn't know that Jesus wasn't speaking Hebrew every day. Nobody spoke Hebrew every day. It was a dead language. It was like Latin is dead today. It still existed in tiny corners, but it wasn't a going concern at all. That's relevant. And the fact that pastors don't know is a big deal. And in particular, pastors are terrified of telling people the Jews killed God. Scripture makes that so clear that no one could possibly reach any other conclusion other than by listening to voices that do not come from Scripture. So the last third of this is going to go through many verses that make it abundantly clear that the Pharisees were the leaders, the Jews were the people. The angry crowd that was continuously chasing Jesus around, hundreds of miles are running in sandals, continuously trying to kill him. It wasn't the Pharisees, it was the Jews. Not all of them. There were some Jews who were faithful. His, his followers were Jews. The disciples were Jews. It's, so again, you know, the Naxal things come, comes into play. Not all X are like that. There were Jews in that day who believed the promise. Mary believed the promise of the Christ. And so when the angel came to her and said that she would be the vessel for that promise, she wasn't confused. She knew exactly what the angel was talking about. She couldn't believe that it was going to be her, but she received it in faith because she was a faithful Christian. She was a Christian who was a Jew. And we've talked about that in the past, that the belief in the promise from the garden is what makes one a Christian. And so we're going to end as we're talking about, you know, particularly from Acts and from Romans, where Scripture discusses who are the true children of Abraham, because that's one of the fundamental questions that, <laughs> unfortunately today, it's a political question somehow. That'll be a future episode where we talk about how children of Abraham, how could that possibly be a political question? live issue in the 21st century. That's why saying the Jews makes people nervous, because something that should be a scriptural historical term and concept has political ramifications today. So today's episode of Scripture, future episodes will deal with history and some politics, but we have to lay the foundation first for this subject in what God reveals in Scripture. So I think we'll begin at the very beginning just with who is a Jew? in the Old Testament. I think one of the lazy things that we do is to just kind of assume that, well, everybody in the Old Testament's a Jew. Like, that's the Jewish book, and then the New Testament book is a Christian book. And there were some Jews who became Christians, but that was that transition period. And then post-New Testament, everybody's Christian. Or you're a Jew, but you went off in the other direction. But the key element is that the misconception that everyone in the Old Testament is a Jew opens the door to all sorts of errors downstream. We're not going to get to those errors today. We're just going to make the case that Jews came into the timeline by God's design at a certain time for a certain purpose. And prior to that, there were no Jews. Adam was not a Jew. I think one of the tricky things about that is that Adam is a Hebrew word. And so it's just, we're just sort of intellectually lazy, and we think, well, if the, if the name was Hebrew, that make, must make him a Jew, right? There are, Adam, there are Adams today who are Jews, many who are not, because it's, you know, it's an ancient, it's the oldest name we have. When you start making these small errors, they don't seem to have any consequence at the moment, but they will accumulate over time. And that's a recurring theme on Stone Choir. These small errors are doors that are being opened to make big errors later. So as we go through this, we're going to nitpick seemingly small things, but they're all going to point in the same direction to say, this man was a Jew, this man was not a Jew, here's what the Jews were doing, and why all those things matter. When you mention that the name is in Hebrew, it brings to mind a favorite argument that I've seen primarily from leftists, Marxists, and others like that, but you'll see it on posters and things that rally sometimes for them. Because they like to appeal to Scripture, even though they don't believe in it. That should bring a certain meme to mind for certain people. But they'll argue there are no white people in Scripture. Which, of course, just betrays a staggering ignorance of Scripture, because Japheth is the father of all of Europe. Obviously, then, he was white. There are Romans in Scripture, there are Greeks in Scripture. It's a complete nonsense argument. It just betrays stunning ignorance 
ignorance of Scripture. And that's what we're dealing with when it comes to pastors and many others who will say, well, no, all these people, they were Jews. Adam was not a Jew. Noah was not a Jew. Abraham was not a Jew. You don't have any Jews in Scripture until you get to Judah. Because that is how you derive the term Jew is from the tribe of Judah. That's where that comes from, and from Judean. So the modern term, in English anyway, enters basically through Latin. The term for the people living in Palestine, as the Romans renamed it, who were living in Palestine at the time that Rome controlled the area. And it wasn't even a term that they used for themselves. They no. they didn't call themselves Jews. It was it was just shorthand because the, the northern kingdom had been destroyed. You had these people in the south and in Judah, so they got called Jews by their conquerors. <laughs> like it, it wasn't if it was a slur, but it was just it was a term applied to a group of people that was alien to the people naming them. They just didn't care, like, oh yeah, those are the, the Jews down there in, in Judea. Yeah, exactly. And there are some who will argue that the etymology for Hebrew, which is the term they would have used before that, and still, of course, do use for themselves and for their language, which we'll get into the language more, that's derived either from Eber, which can have, of course, that initial H sound in the Greek, Heber, or it is derived from an older term from, I can't remember which language it was now, I think it was related to a handful of languages in the area, so it's not necessarily just one, but it means across the river, or one who lives across the river. And so it was just a term of place, essentially. Also a person's name, obviously Eber being the son of Shalah, son of Arpachshad, son of Shem. Shem being the ultimate father after Noah, of course, after Adam, after Noah, of the line from which Christ came. And so the people who would become known as Jews, at least a part of them would become known as Jews, because as was said, the northern kingdom was destroyed. The Assyrian captivity of the northern kingdom took those ten tribes, and yes, there's some fuzz there, some gray area when it comes to the numbering of the tribes, how many tribes exactly were in the south, how many were in the, the north, because you have ten in the north, but then you have Judah, Benjamin, and Levi in the south. That aside, the Assyrian captivity is what took the northern kingdom and destroyed it. The people of the northern kingdom were destroyed because how the Assyrians destroyed a conquered people was they would take some of those out of the conquered territory, move them elsewhere in their empire, and then take people from elsewhere in the empire and move them into the conquered territory. So in other words, what they did was they used interbreeding interracial relationships as a means of destruction of a nation. And that's exactly what they did to the Northern Kingdom. So the Northern Kingdom was completely and utterly destroyed, which of course is the beginning of an argument against so-called Christian Zionism and many other, well, heretical theologies that have sprung up more recently. You can't have a restoration of the 12 tribes because 10 of them no longer exist. They were destroyed by the Assyrians, as opposed to the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, which was taken into partial captivity by the Babylonians, but the Babylonians did not destroy their conquered peoples in the same way the Assyrians did. So the southern kingdom was not destroyed. That would become the Judeans. That would be the people who were living in the area when the Romans came and conquered them. Those are the people who would come to be called Jews. And so early on in Scripture, all of these men are not Jews. Jews don't exist in the earliest parts of Scripture. There are no Jews in Genesis. Unless you're talking just about names, in which case, yes, you have obviously the genealogies. But if your pastor is telling you that Abraham was a Jew, your pastor is just wrong. He needs to go back and read Scripture. The first occurrence in both the Septuagint and the Masoretic text for the Old Testament of the word Hebrew is in Genesis 39 when Potiphar's wife 
describes Joseph as the Hebrew slave. So that was several generations removed from Abraham. That's not Jew, but it's the first instance of Hebrew. There is one instance that's worth noting in Genesis 13, where when Abram has not yet received the name Abraham from God, the text, the Masoretic text, that is the Hebrew text, that is much newer, incidentally, than the Septuagint, even though it's technically written to Hebrew, and we'll get to that later. In Genesis 13, the Masoretic text does refer to, or maybe it's Genesis 14, I think it's 14, 13, refers to Abram as the Hebrew. Interestingly, in the Septuagint, the word Hebrew does not appear. That word was added in the Hebrew text, which is notable, I think, because while we're not going to get into the disputation between the Masoretic text and the Septuagint, it is important to acknowledge that there are a few places where the Masoretic text is demonstrably corrupted. The most prominent example is the prophecy in Isaiah of the virgin giving birth. That is changed in what we call the Hebrew Bible today to a young girl. Septuagint doesn't have that error. And if you remember from our genealogy episode, that's a particularly interesting one because we actually have evidence from post-Babel expansion of humanity in all different directions. People who were never part of any of this story had the story of a virgin birth of a god. That is something that is a widespread story, a myth, a legend that exists in far-flung places like Vietnam, well separated from any contact with anyone who would have known what was going on in the days of Abraham. So, or Isaiah for that matter, because Isaiah was fairly late. So it's crucially important to note that we know from outside of Scripture that some notion of of a virgin-born God was a prophecy that was given prior to Isaiah, and it was shared among believers and then corrupted among unbelievers. So we can know with absolute certainty as Christians that when the Hebrew Bible, the Masoretic text that we are told to believe is older, says young girl instead of virgin— It's not correct. So I think it's worth acknowledging that the word Hebrew does occur one time in Abram's day, but I I just found this, you know, a couple hours ago. I haven't had a chance to really dig into it too much. Based on what I know of a couple of the other errors, it's my assumption as I go digging into that 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 was probably added in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th century AD. It was added well after by Jews who had been expelled from Jerusalem, who hated the Christians, and were beginning to concoct this story that Hebrews are eternal. You know, Noah was a Hebrew, Noah was a Jew. No, Abraham wasn't a Jew. It was his grandson who was named Israel by God. That's the other term that comes up that's very important. Basically, you have Jew, you have Hebrew, and you have Israel or Israelite, all more or less used interchangeably at different places and different times. Sometimes they mean the same thing, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they mean different things. And so when God wrestles with Jacob and then names him Israel, that's the very first time that that word was used. It was given to him by God as a new name, and that name was carried by his descendants. That's very important. It's from God. No Christian would ever besmirch that in the slightest. But as we'll get to it in the last part, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a child of Abraham, to be a child of the covenant? When we get into the some of the later texts in the New Testament, pointing back to the Old Testament makes it very clear, it means those who have faith, that it is not a genetic lineage, it is a lineage of faith. As we discussed in the election episode, which is very much a part of this episode, please go back and listen to that if you haven't listened to it in the last couple months. It is key to understanding this episode, because one of the other terms that gets thrown around a lot is chosen. You hear of the Jews called God's chosen people. It's a word that God uses. God says, I chose these people. Many times that's how it's referred to, how how the Israelites are referred to. Chosen and elect are synonyms. And this is something that we've completely lost sight of today. When God says, I chose you, that's literally saying, I elected you. And so in the election episode, we explain in detail that Election is not a new doctrine that Calvin came up with. You know, there's most people think that, oh, election or predestination, that's that Calvinist stuff. 
as Lutherans, we call what Calvinists hold double predestination, where God elected some to be saved and God elected others to be damned. We believe that Scripture doesn't say that. Scripture says that God elected some to be saved and that God desires that all men be saved and that God's sacrifice on the cross was for all men. And so those men who are damned are damned of their own volition. They choose to remain evil. They reject God. Those who are elect do not reject God. And so we spend a couple hours dealing with how does that make sense? Because it sounds irrational. Frankly, it is irrational. You can't make a reasonable case for predestination that doesn't sound crazy. So we do it there as best we can. It makes sense if you believe Scripture. What you can believe is your own reason. But the important thing to carry away is that whenever you hear someone saying, particularly in the Old Testament, these people were the chosen people of God, they were elect. And that applied not only to the lineal descendants of Abraham, because remember Jonah, who was a Jewish prophet, was sent by God to go to Nineveh, which was one of the greatest of the Gentile cities. It was one of the largest cities on the planet at the time. Jonah wouldn't go because he knew they would believe, and they would repent, and they would become children of God. God said, the people of Nineveh are elect to go to them and proclaim my word. And Jonah's like, no, if I go, they'll believe me, and they'll repent. I don't want that, because they're not Jews. And so the whole story of Jonah is about him refusing to go to people who weren't Jews because he didn't want to give them the gospel. God elected them. Jonah disobeyed. God won, because that's how election works. God doesn't lose. He doesn't lose any of us. So these terms like Jew, chosen, Israelite, Hebrew, it's important to understand which term you're using and why and where it's coming from etymologically because sometimes they do serve different purposes. And for those who are maybe not particularly familiar with these source texts, the Masoretic text is from roughly the earliest would be the 6th century, and that's AD, not BC notably. It wasn't completed until the 9th or the 10th century. That is, say, as opposed to the Septuagint, which is from, I think the earliest copies we have are the 3rd century BC. So there's a significant difference in age between these two manuscript sources. Notably, of course, The Masoretic text also has the so-called Star of David all over it. We see that in many of the copies of things that we have related to that line of sources. We'll get into that perhaps, perhaps not in this episode, but soon enough. That'll be for the next episode. That's what I figured. Yeah, That symbol does date back before that. I think the earliest instance of that in a religious context is the 3rd or the 4th century, again, A.D., not B.C., but at any rate. So it is arguably the more reliable text, is the Greek text. And that is the text the Church has used for a very long time, until modern translations started using the Masoretic. I think it's important, we're not going to get into textual criticism or anything today, but when people are hearing these things, one of the most common responses internally in someone's mind will probably be to have their confidence undermined and, well, is my Bible really the Word of God? I think that the more manuscripts we get access to, the more clear it is how much God has preserved His Word through the millennia. There's very few differences between the Masoretic text and the Septuagint in Greek. There's very little difference between all the various manuscripts in Greek. They're overwhelmingly almost identical. The changes are typically small and incidental. It, oftentimes, they're, it's clear that they're just copyist errors. Occasionally, you will have things that were in the margin that then got migrated where someone had made a note to himself, and someone said, well, that sounds good, and ended up inserting it into the text. So the reason it's important... I don't want anyone who's hearing us talk about these two different textual sources to think, oh no, my Bible is wrong. You're reading your Bible in English. It's far removed from these languages. It's translated by men who, for the most part, were doing the best they could. Every translation today has some problems. That's okay. It's not going to destroy your faith. 
God has preserved his word for thousands of years, he will continue to do so. Yes, we should seek to have the most reliable books of the Bible that we can get our hands on. We should seek to have faithful translations. When errors are discovered, we should figure out why and how, and we should get rid of them. But none of these conversations should ever be an excuse for you to think, oh man, I I just, I can't trust any of this now. I don't know what's going on. I don't have confidence. God has preserved his word. He preserved it in the Masoretic text, even in spite of the interference of the post Christian Jews who were rabidly against the Christians, they still preserved almost all the text completely intact. So when there are variations, that should not be a source to think, oh no, something terrible has gone wrong. In a few cases, like, yeah, this it's clear why this change was made. It's almost never the case otherwise. So please don't conclude from listening to this episode, I need to get rid of my Bible and get a different one. I have to learn about this or I'm not going to have confidence. That's not the case. Whatever Bible you have, God is going to use for your edification. As if you want to learn more about this stuff, there's plenty to to learn and study and dig into it and to be enriched. I think that's the important part is that learning about these variations is enriching. It doesn't undermine faith because the more you look at the different copies, the more you realize how much they're on the same page, which is miraculous. The only way that this stuff could have been preserved across thousands of examples across millennia is if God was intervening in time and space with the copyists, with the manuscripts, with the papyri. Only God could have done this. So even when we find things like, well, that doesn't seem quite right, doesn't mean God didn't do this stuff. It just means that when humans are involved, we have to pay attention. That's why this podcast exists, because humans are involved. We have to pay attention to stuff. So please do not lose confidence in whatever Bible you have, because that is God's word given to you for your edification. I personally primarily make use of the ESV. That's, I have, most of my Bibles are ESV. I have, I don't even know how many Bibles at this point, but that is, in the Old Testament, primarily relying on the Masoretic. I have no problem trusting the text of the ESV. Yes, there are some little problems here and there. They play some games with a couple words, but I'm not worried about it. It is still God's word. It is still reliable. And to give listeners an idea of the sort of differences between the Greek source documents we use for translating the scriptures. One of the more famous examples is the announcement of the angels to the shepherds. In some of the manuscripts, there's an iota missing. Literally the smallest letter in Greek. It's just a scribal error. It was dropped. It changes the meaning in terms of nuance, but it does not change the meaning in terms of content. It basically shifts from the angels announcing peace on earth and goodwill toward men to peace on earth and goodwill toward men on whom God's favor rests. It's a minor thing, and obviously, again, smallest letter in Greek, scribal error. That's the sort of thing you're seeing when you see disagreements between the manuscripts. These are not big disagreements. They're usually relatively minor things. So again, yes, your Bible in English or whatever language you're reading it in is reliable. You can rely on that. Yes, it's helpful to have some resort to the underlying languages, but you don't even actually have to know them in this day and age because you can go and find websites online where you can click on a word in a verse and it will tell you exactly what it means in the underlying language. So you can verify for yourself. If, if something you read, you have questions, talk to your pastor, talk to someone who understands it, or find one of these sites and do the study on your own. There is a wealth of information and tools at our disposal today that would have made scholars in the past incredibly envious. So on the subject of language, as we you know, we mentioned, as I'm sure you all know, the, the northern kingdom of Israel was conquered in 722 BC by the Assyrians. As Corey mentioned, when the Assyrians conquered them, they used the importation of foreigners to basically impose race mixing to wipe out those tribes. And the result was the Samaritans, which is why in Scripture we are all familiar with the notions that the Samaritans were treated as as filthy, as less than, as, as half-breeds, because they had been Israelites, they had been Hebrews at one point, but then when the Assyrians forcibly mixed them with other races, 
they cease to have the Israelite bloodline. And the Jews of the first century found that disgusting. They had, they had always been disgusted by them. The Samaritans and the Jews had disliked each other for many centuries to that point. The Samaritans were created by having been conquered. And what's important about the conquering is that the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Persians and then the Greeks and then the Romans, in turn, each conquering them, by the way, all judgment from God, when you get conquered five times in almost as many centuries by disparate people who are crushing you, that's a bad sign. God has turned his back on you. And scripture makes that clear. There, were, there was a sea of, of prophets coming to them, calling to them the, to repent for their wickedness that had led to the destruction of the two kingdoms in the first place. One of the things that occurred under Assyria and then Persian rule is that the original Hebrew language in which Moses had written the Torah, when God transcribed the Torah for Moses and he wrote it down, he used what is today called Proto-Hebrew. The Proto-Hebrew alphabet is similar to hieroglyphs. They think it's probably derived. It's kind of downstream. It's not It's not pictograms, but it's sort of similar in that vein of kind of simple geometric shapes and some symbols, but it's a fairly primitive language. Today it's called Proto-Hebrew because what replaced it just gets called Hebrew. And that's one of the first big things that's really important to, to learn in this episode is that, as I said earlier, what you see today when you think, oh yeah, that's Hebrew, it isn't. It is an alphabet that was imposed. It's, it's the Aramaic alphabet. They're related, but it's related through the Persian conquest. It has no relation whatsoever to the language of Moses. And I think that's important, just as a fact. Like you don't need to derive any particular theological conclusion from it, but simply as a fact, when Moses wrote the Ten Commandments on the stone tablets, it was not in what we call Hebrew today. In fact, I think if it's not the show art, we'll definitely include the image. Charlton Heston's Ten Commandments movie, the poster with him holding the Ten Commandments, actually has proto-Hebrew on it. It has the proto-Hebraic alphabet. They got that detail right. If they were to remake that today, they would never do that. They would use the fake Hebrew script that's actually Aramaic today that came from Persia. Why? Because we think that we think that there's a direct continuity between Abraham and Moses and Jesus and us. And languages go through those evolutions. I was just looking earlier today at uh, Middle English and Old English just to see, for example, could I comprehend something that was you know a thousand, twelve hundred years old? Middle English, I can I can read most of it. You know, some of the vocabulary is strange. There are a few symbols, a few letters that have been transposed into other letters today, but it's intelligible for the most part. That's still English. And that's something that's from, you know, seven, eight hundred years ago. You go back to old English that's, you know, over a thousand years old. I can't read it. I can pick out a few words if I know how to phonetically describe them. I can maybe guess at what some of them are, but although it's called old English as an English speaker, it's not accessible to me. So this happens all the time in language. It's not it's not inherently that something is up, something is sneaky for the Hebrew of today, what is called modern Hebrew, to not match what existed in the first century or what existed 500 years before Christ. But it is important because I think almost everyone thinks that's not the case. We think that we have this ancient stuff and that the, you know, the sort of scripted, square, almost calligraphic letters that you know as the Hebrew language, you think that that's what Moses was reading and writing. And probably what you know Adam was reading, right? Because obviously Adam was a Jew too. Well, no, the first Jew, you know, was Jacob. Maybe if you want to say all Israelites are Jews, I don't care. We'll talk about some of the history of the terminology in the next episode. But the important part is that there's a fundamental discontinuity. And when they were conquered and they had their alphabet replaced, they had their language replaced. The Hebrew language was lost. It was completely lost in the Northern Kingdom. They. The Samaritans, they preserved, the, interestingly, the Samaritan alphabet is basically the proto-Hebraic alphabet. It preserves many of those same symbols. It looks very similar. 
it's completely disconnected from what is modern Hebrew or Aramaic. If you look at Old Hebrew or Proto-Hebrew or whichever term you want to use for it, it looks very similar to Phoenician. So if you have seen Phoenician lettering before somewhere, museum or whatnot, you know exactly what Old Hebrew looked like. And they are both derived from Proto-Sinaitic, which was even older than that. That looks very similar. It's missing some letters. But as was mentioned, modern Hebrew is not what Scripture... It's not the language in which Scripture was written. It's not the text, the alphabet in which Scripture was written, because this is actually an alphabet that was written in Old Hebrew, which actually... Another thing to which you could compare it if you know runic, it looks much more similar to runic than, say, modern Hebrew slash Aramaic or modern English Latin lettering. But Hebrew itself, the language, was basically dead by the time of Christ. It was still used to some degree in what would be considered today perhaps academic circles. So you would have had some handful of priests in Jerusalem who could still read this language. They didn't use the language. They didn't speak the language. Maybe they read the language aloud at certain services on high holy days. They would have had someone there to translate it into Aramaic for the common people because the common people did not know any Hebrew. So at least they had more decency than the medieval Roman church, which didn't even bother to translate from Latin. But you can think of it in that same sort of light. In the medieval era, you had church services being conducted in Latin. The common people did not know Latin anymore. Some of the educated class knew Latin, so it's not directly comparable, because you did have Europeans who still knew Latin, who still learned Latin, the sons of noble houses and such. But the common people did not know what was going on in the church service because it was conducted in Latin and they did not translate it into the vernacular. You had a similar thing happening around the the switchover, as it were, from B.C. to A.D., where Hebrew was no longer understood by the common people. They spoke Aramaic because they had been conquered a number of times by Aramaic-speaking peoples, and so they had used Aramaic in order to deal with their new neighbors, as it were, to handle trade, all of these various things were conducted in Aramaic. And so they lost their language over time. That's what happens if you stop using your language, you lose your language. And when they were conquered by Alexander around 330 BC, they began to speak Greek. They were probably speaking some before that. But if you look at the original languages of the Apocrypha, the books that were written in the intertestamental period after Malachi and before Matthew, none of them were written Hebrew. None of them are written in Aramaic. They're written in Greek. The Septuagint was translated around 250 BC. Now, this was in part because I believe it was Ptolemy II had requested that the laws of the Hebrews be translated so that they were accessible, but it was also because the people needed it. There were certainly some Aramaic texts of, of Scripture that were available to them, but increasingly there were people who were Jews ethnically who in some cases, may not have spoken Aramaic either. The, the translation of Scripture in the Septuagint into Greek was also for accessibility. And so by the first century, when Jesus was born and the disciples were alive and were writing and speaking, they were, as Corey said, none of, virtually none of them would have been conversant in Hebrew at all, because it would have been no point. For someone to be speaking Hebrew would be identical to someone today speaking maybe Latin or Old English. You know, it's a dead language that isn't used at all, so it's a party trick. Maybe you can have an interesting conversation where you teach someone something, but you can't converse. It's not a language of commerce. The languages that were used were Greek, Latin, and Aramaic, and that's reflected at Christ's crucifixion. In John 19... Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. It was not written, incidentally, in Hebrew. 
because there would have been no point. It wasn't that they ran out of room. It was if they put Hebrew above Christ's head, no one would have been able to read it. That's a big deal. Like, it's a small detail. I, I don't think it's like some huge, profound insight. But, oh, by the way, did you know that no one who was speaking Hebrew in Jesus' day? Most people probably don't know that. Please go look this stuff up. I can tell you, you can spend hours just on Wikipedia going through the various articles about the language of Jesus on Aramaic, on Proto-Hebrew. Go do some reading and, you know, go do some wiki holing where you dig down and dig through. You will find some places where some of the articles disagree, usually around some of these sensitive areas that we're talking about directly. Where they disagree, I would give the benefit of the doubt to the version that's less friendly to the modern narrative, to the idea everyone from Adam to Jesus just spoke Hebrew and wrote in Hebrew because that was the universal language. No. These Semitic languages were basically a dead end. They're pretty primitive languages. They're not remotely as sophisticated as something like Greek or Latin. And nothing, almost nothing is really downstream from them. Like they, they ran their course and then the civilizations went away and the languages went away. So there was nothing that they contributed to later. That's not the case with the language we're speaking today. English has had tributaries from many other languages and they were languages of the winners. Hebrew is not a language of the winners. It's a language of the conquered and of the losers. It's worth putting special emphasis on the term that was actually on the cross, what Pilate actually put on the cross, and that was Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judaiorum. That last word, Judaiorum, is Judeans. That's the word from which we get Jews, as previously mentioned, in English. We ultimately derive it from the Latin. It's a demonym, basically. It is a term related to the people of a particular place. That's how the Romans named that's how the Romans named everyone they encountered was according to the land where they found them. And so that's where we get this term. It's not even the word Jew isn't even in scripture in the original languages. That's the term that we use in English. Because in scripture, it's Judean. And as we mentioned the history, these are some of the tribes descended from Israel. On the subject of terms, I think it's important to note that this is one of the key places, particularly in Scripture and in conversation, where Hebrew ceases to mean the same thing. So the the key example for this is John 19, 17. In the ESV, it says, And he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Now, if you're a King James reader, you know that is, and he bearing his cross went forth into the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. Now, one of those is wrong because Hebrew and Aramaic are two different languages. I think it's notable that in many of the cases in Scripture in the New Testament, when Jesus is quoted, when he says things like Abba Father or Eloi Eloi Lama Sabachthani, he's speaking Aramaic. And Growing up, no one ever taught me why. I thought, wow, why like why did he slip into some other language? It's, it's Jesus. He's a Jew. He's he's why is this Hebrew guy talking Aramaic all of a sudden? Did like did he speak Aramaic when he got excited? No. He was always speaking Aramaic to those around him. He's these things were recorded, and God through the Holy the Holy Spirit recorded these in the actual words that Jesus spoke, because they were the words he was speaking all the time. But they weren't translated even today. So we hear Abba, and we hear Eloi instead of the translated word from the Aramaic. The reason that the King James gets this wrong, and yes, sorry guys, if you're a King James only, it gets a lot of things wrong. They're not hugely impactful. They did the best they could. If they had had more manuscripts, they would have translated a different Bible than the one they translated. It's useful. I think it's outlived its use. That's a conversation for another day. The important thing is if you look in Greek in John 19, 17, the word that King James translates in Hebrew is Hebraisty. The problem here is that Hebrew means one of two things. Either Hebrew language means the Hebrew language, as you would say the English language. You know, when, when I say English language, you know that I don't mean an Englishman. And see, that's the distinction. 
It could be the language of the Hebrew people, as in the language of the English people, or it could be the specific language. Now, the distinction is that in Judah, in Judea, they were the Hebrew people, and so whatever language they were speaking in Judea was the Hebrew language because they were the Hebrew people. The I, I hope I'm making this clear, but the Hebrew language of the Judean people was, was Aramaic. When it says the Hebrew language, it doesn't mean they were speaking Hebrew. It means the Hebrews were speaking their language, which was Aramaic. And this is something that Josephus, who was the famous historian from the first century AD, he said himself, he was a Jew, he was he was well-connected, he was well-favored, he is viewed by Jews today as, as a traitor. Uh, for 1,900 years, they wouldn't translate anything he had said because they were so angry at him for siding with the Romans. Josephus differentiated Hebrew from his language and that of the first century Israel. He refers to Hebrew words as belonging to the Hebrew tongue, but refers to Aramaic words as belonging to our tongue or our language or the language of our country. So when Josephus, the Hebrew, the Jew of the first century, refers to his language in the possessive, he always refers to Aramaic. He never refers to Hebrew as in the Hebrew that was spoken by Moses or the Hebrew that was spoken in 800 BC because nobody spoke it anymore. He was very well educated. He he may have known it perhaps because he was so well educated, but again, it would have been an academic exercise and not a social one. And this is also borne out as we find texts, for example, from the Qumran caves and other places. When we find texts, if it's using what we see today as the what we call the Hebrew alphabet, it's always written in Aramaic. There's nothing written in Hebrew in what we call the Hebrew language, or the Hebrew alphabet today. I realize some of this is probably getting confusing because th that's the point of discussing it. The same word is used to, in different contexts to mean different things. And while that's not necessarily duplicitous, it's very easy to get lazy or to get sloppy and then to make errors that downstream have serious problems. Because when you look in a place like the Qumran cave and you don't find much, if any, Hebrew, there's a little bit in there, but I think it's some of the, the newer stuff. It's important because this was an archive. Like this was, I think today when we think, oh, well, you found something in one language and something in, in another language, you probably have hundreds of books in your homes. Most people listening easily have many dozens, probably hundreds of books in your home. The threshold for writing something down today, for putting something on paper, is basically zero. I have probably 800 books in my house. A lot of them are crap. They were things that didn't need to be put down on paper. That wasn't the case 2,000 years ago. It was so incredibly expensive to record anything that for something to be written down, whether on parchment or on papyrus, meant that it was profoundly important. And so the preponderance of the evidence when you're looking at whatever was written tells you about the languages that they spoke. If no one was speaking what we call Hebrew, then you're not going to find much, if any, of it. And that's what we find. We find Aramaic and some of the other languages. We do not find what is called Hebrew today. And it seems like this is somewhat confusing, perhaps, but we really have the same thing in English. Typically, a German will speak German. Exact same noun, used in two very different ways. The English speak English. However, Americans speak English. And perhaps one of the best examples, the Belgians who live in Belgium don't speak Belgian. They speak Dutch, French, and German. So just because a term has multiple different meanings doesn't mean that the meanings are identical. Doesn't mean the term is always used in the same way. And scripture also doesn't always record the language of the original interactions. So it is worth noting, Christ knew Greek. He probably used Greek a lot in his ministry. Because do remember, he was ministering at times in the vicinity of Greek-speaking cities. He would probably have used Greek to speak to those people because many of them probably were not particularly good at Aramaic. They were, in some cases, Greeks who had moved from Greece to these Greek colonies or had moved to Roman colonies. Perhaps they were from somewhere else in the Roman Empire 
but the language of everyday life in the Roman Empire at that time was Greek. Yes, that seems confusing as well, but the Romans used Greek because some of the peoples they had conquered, in particular the Greeks, spoke Greek. It was an easy language to use for everyday interactions, for commerce, and all the things you need to run everyday life in an empire. Latin was still the language of the empire at the higher level, so in the Senate, the laws, and things like that. But they spoke Greek. And so Christ, again, would also have used Greek. And this is something that's made very clear in the New Testament itself. As we all know, New Testament quotes the Old Testament over and over and over again. You can find numerous web pages that show all the connections of direct quotes of the New Testament quoting the Old Testament. The reason that's important is that many, I, I think perhaps the majority, you can correct me if I'm wrong, if you know off the top of your head, but I think the majority of the quotes of the Old Testament in the New Testament quote the Septuagint, they quote the Greek. Now, it's not that it's two different Bibles, it's just that they're different ways of phrasing things and perhaps different word order that would be preserved differently in Aramaic or Hebrew versus Greek. And so we know that the writers of the New Testament, that the men who are recorded as speaking, spoke Greek because they quote Scripture in Greek. They frequently quote the Septuagint, not exclusively, which is important. As we said earlier, I don't reject one over the other because Scripture doesn't, so I'm not going to do something that God didn't do. But it's important to know that Greek is frequently used in as the reference of the Old Testament in the New. That is substantial. That's important. And it's something that you don't, you don't hear very much unless you actually get into these fiddly arguments about which one is better. We're not trying to make the argument for which one is better. Personally, I, I wish that Hebrew no longer existed. I think it's doing more harm than good. It's not an argument I'm going to make here. It's simply important to note that Greek is what Jesus spoke. It's what Paul spoke. They all spoke it. They spoke other languages too. They're not like the average American. They could hold more than one language in their head, and they did so on a daily basis. And so when Scripture quotes Scripture from the New to the Old, it frequently quotes Scripture, God, in Greek. For the percentage of quotes that come from the Septuagint versus other translations, it would depend on whether you're counting direct or also indirect, and indirect starts to get difficult because there are a lot of those. I believe the, the standard number, as it were, for direct quotations from the Old Testament is 283, and 170 of those are essentially from the Septuagint, so 60%. So yes, the majority of the quotations that are direct quotations from the Old Testament in the New Testament are from the Greek. But just to emphasize what I said about Scripture not always recording the original language in which something took place, in what language did Moses interact with Pharaoh? Well, Scripture doesn't tell us. It was probably Egyptian, because he was educated in Pharaoh's household he spoke Egyptian. It would have made sense for him to deal in the language of the Egyptian court when he was dealing with the Egyptian court. Scripture doesn't tell us that, but from context, we can, of course, infer that as a reasonable conclusion. Another thing that we can infer as a reasonable conclusion from the New Testament, from what it actually tells us, when it does tell us the language of the original, when Christ is speaking Aramaic, in the cases where he is in Scripture, we are told specifically that this was in Aramaic. Well, that implies he was not always using Aramaic. He may have been using Greek more than Aramaic, in fact, because it is specifically noted when he used Aramaic. Now, you don't have to necessarily draw that conclusion. I'm not saying this is a tenet of the faith and you absolutely have to believe Christ spent most of his time speaking Koine Greek. I'm not saying that. But it is a reasonable inference to draw from what Scripture does tell us. We know that he would have used Greek. He lived in an area that spoke Greek. He lived around people who spoke Greek. He dealt with people who spoke Greek. He undoubtedly used Greek. And the last point to hammer home is that the reason that was happening is that nobody spoke Hebrew. Nobody spoke Hebrew. It may have been done ceremonially in the, in the temple, that's likely, it may be that a few of the educated men, including probably Christ himself, because he was educated in the temple, 
would have been able to read the original Hebrew language, actual Hebrew alphabet scrolls, but they had to be translated because apart from the few experts, nobody else knew it. And yes, this is a small point. This isn't this isn't earth shattering, but it's really interesting that most people don't know this because again, you see the, what's called the Hebrew language smacked on everything today. And it's like, oh, that's the Bible language. That's the language of Jesus. That's what we automatically think. I thought that until a couple of years ago when I learned about this. Like, what's going on? Like, why didn't someone just tell me the truth? What's the difference between the true version and the made-up version? Well, there are things downstream from the made-up version that turned out not to be very good for Christians. I'll be in future episodes, but we're just making the case today that just know for a fact that Jesus was not running around talking Hebrew because no one would have understood him. The Hebrews didn't speak Hebrew. They were still Hebrew. They were still descended from Abraham, which is is one of the last things that we're going to get into here today. The We're going to conclude this just by reading a number of passages from the New Testament that specifically refute the claim that's very often made. It usually flares up around Easter during Holy Week, Usually by Good Friday, there have been think pieces and people fretting, saying it's so anti-Semitic for people to say that the Jews killed Christ. The Romans killed Christ, our sins killed Christ, anything killed Christ except for the Jews. It is true. Your sins killed Christ, my sins killed Christ. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Saying how that happened does not diminish the soteriological aspect of it. So there's no point in making any argument about the facts that try to defend soteriology against men who don't dispute the soteriology. We know how we are saved, and we know why we need to be saved. We need to be saved from our own sin. God did that on the cross. God's sacrifice on the cross was for us, and it was our sins that caused it. Our sins are the ultimate cause. The penultimate cause was the Jews. The Jews who had been trying to kill Christ for three and a half years finally succeeded. And then the proximate cause was the Romans. Of course, it was Pilate. Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. You know, that's his epitaph for eternity in the creeds. You know, talk about a legacy. The guy shows up briefly in history, and he's known as the man who scourges the Son of God. And yet, his actions are less egregious than what the Jews did. And I can say that because that's literally what Jesus says. He says that those who turn me over to you have the greater sin. When God says that, we don't get to disagree. So when there are the hysterics around who killed Jesus, it is not lying. It's not lying to say that the Romans killed Christ. They crucified him. Why? Because they were the only ones with the legal authority to do so. The Jews had been trying to murder Christ for years, They had been trying to stone him, anything they could do to kill him. They finally got their ducks in a row politically and coerced Herod and Pontius Pilate into doing it for them. Not because they wouldn't have done it themselves, because they didn't have the legal authority to do it. And obviously, Jesus was incarnate for our sins. It's not dismissing or minimizing or taking anything away from the fact that we are the reason that Christ had to die on the cross for us. It still matters who did it. And when you... when The reason we're doing these episodes is that Christians have been put in this box where we're not allowed to speak as God speaks. And why? Because the Jews. To say the Jews, again, as I said at the very beginning, makes people frightened, makes them nervous and scared. And they don't know what's going to happen next, but they know it's not going to be good. That is not the Christian response to anything. We should be fearless and we should be confident in our God and in the truth and especially the truth as it's found in Scripture. And so these next passages we're going to look at are specifically all the cases. They were just cherry-picking some some of the myriad passages in the New Testament where it explicitly says that it was the Jews who were trying to kill Christ, because when they ultimately succeeded in killing Christ, mission accomplished. You cannot possibly look at all these passages and then get to the crucifixion and think, wow, I can't believe the Romans did that just out of nowhere. It's just It would be laughable. No Christian reading the Bible would ever reach that conclusion. And yet so many Christians and pastors reach that conclusion today. 
I've heard things that we're going to read here refuted from pulpits, where pastors are afraid to attribute to the Jews, to the crowd, to the masses, to the group, that which Scripture attributes to them. So one of the first ones is the, the very beginning of Matthew, at the, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Interestingly, this is actually, sorry, this is prior to his ministry. The very first time the Jew tried to kill him was Herod the Great. As soon as he was born and, and the news came, Herod the Great, who was a ruler, but he was also a Jew, said the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take this child and his mother, and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod the Great is about to search for the child to destroy him. So literally Jesus' entire life on earth was bookended by Jews trying to kill him. And I think that's important because one of the conversations that frequently comes up is to try to shift the emphasis to the political. In Herod's case, it was undoubtedly political. All he knew was that someone was saying maybe some prophecy had been fulfilled and maybe some Messiah or something is happening. I, you know, he, he knew the prophecies. He just didn't want any competition. He didn't want uprisings. He'd had enough of that. And so the easy thing was to go kill a few babies. Later on, when the Jews are chasing Jesus around, trying to stone him repeatedly, it's not for political reasons. It's for blasphemy. It's for when he says he's the son of God, that's when they try to kill him. And so when we finally get to the crucifixion on Good Friday, and everyone wants to line up and say, it was the Pharisees who were entirely responsible, and it was because they were jealous of the power, it doesn't bear out when you actually look at the verses that lead up to that for three and a half years that say the complete opposite. Now, of course, that is not to deny that the Pharisees did, in fact, seek to destroy him. The point is that when pastors and others try to minimize the participation of the people, they are perverting scripture. And so this next one does say that the Pharisees were seeking to destroy him, Matthew 12, 14. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. We should note the context of this, because this is what often happens in the pages of Scripture. Christ performs a miracle, and then the Jews seek to kill him because of the miracle, or some extraneous matter related to the miracle. In this case, it is when Christ healed the man with the withered hand. Well, he healed him on the Sabbath, and so the Pharisees decided that that was prohibited by Scripture related to the keeping of the Sabbath, the third commandment. And so they conspired to kill him. Of course, they had other reasons as well. But Christ very clearly explained, it is permissible to do good on the Sabbath. The point of the Sabbath is not to sit on your couch and stare at the ceiling. That's not what it means to keep the Sabbath. But that is a discussion for another time. The same thing played out when Jesus healed the blind man and told him to go and wash his eyes. And when he, when the people saw that he was healed, they became very upset. And there was a long scene there where they interrogate his parents, they interrogate all the witnesses, and they're angry that Jesus had healed a blind man on the Sabbath. It infuriated them. And that's a particularly interesting one because in, I think it's Isaiah 37 and Isaiah 42, Healing the blind is one of the prophecies of God, one of the prophecies pointing to the Messiah. And when the scene erupts where Jesus healed the blind man and people are exclaiming, one of them says, this has never happened in the history of the world. So it wasn't that there had been other prophets in the past who had healed the blind. There had been other healings, but Jesus was the first to ever heal the blind and that's profoundly important because it's a fulfillment of a messianic prophecy. And yet, what was the concern of the Jews? Not that the, the messianic prophecy had been fulfilled before their eyes, not that a miracle had occurred, but that some guy broke the rules, broke their rules as they interpreted them, which is crucial because their interpretations of the Sabbath, as Jesus makes clear in those passages, is not scriptural. It's not a godly interpretation. Jesus says if your ox falls in a ditch on, on the Sabbath, are you not going to get it out? If someone falls in a well, are you not going to get him out? Of course you are. Their definition of work was nonsense. And so Jesus demonstrates through acting justly and in a godly fashion, the hypocrisy and the evil of the Jews. 
who became incensed at this miracle, at this blessing for, for a man who had been blind from birth. That was one of the questions, like, who sinned, this man or his parents? And the, when the man was healed, suddenly they don't care about, you know, the, the trick question. Now they care about the gotcha question, because all that they ever wanted to do was to trip him up to destroy him. I don't think that any other people on the planet would have acted this way. If Jesus had come to the Japanese or to the Germans or to the Ugandans and started performing miracles and healing them, I don't think anyone else would have murdered him. I think part of the reason that Jesus was born a Jew among Jews was that no one else would behave in this way. That's speculative. Maybe I'm being unfair, but I sincerely believe it. I don't think anyone else who shows up and can heal the blind and the deaf and the lame is going to be murdered by people for what? For fulfilling prophecy? Like, they were told that these things would happen, and when they did, they became enraged. And in fact, they frequently said, you have a demon. One of the common refrains, I think it was in John, of the crowds of Jews to scream at Jesus is, you have a demon, how could you say this? I think it's very profound in exemplifying the spiritual nature of the people to whom he was going. Now, obviously, it wasn't all of them. There were followers, there were disciples who were Jews, just like the others. The difference was that they believed. They believed in the promise of the Messiah, and when they saw the promises fulfilled, they rejoiced. That's the difference. It's not that all Jews are bad or that all Jews are saved. It's that when the promise of Scripture is fulfilled in Christ, those with faith, those who are elect, will receive it with gladness, and the rest will shout, he has a demon, and try to kill him. And we see that sort of energy to this day. And yes, that is the same sort of accusation we see today. Freud did not get the idea of projection from nowhere. This is something that the Jews and Satan have been doing for a very long time. It is to accuse the enemy of exactly what you yourself are doing. This is Alinsky again as well, because all of this has the same father. And so that is why the Jews are flinging the accusation of you have a demon at Christ. Well, no, because... The demon is on the other side. Satan's on the other side. Look at how many times Christ had to cast out demons during his ministry. There was a very real and active and widespread problem with possession and demon oppression in this part of the world at this time. And that's why they fling the accusation at Christ. Of course, it's also an insult they like to fling at the Samaritans, which is why at one point, they accuse him of being a Samaritan and having a demon. Now, there are other overtones there as well. They're trying to gin up an excuse to murder him because a Samaritan was not allowed to be where he was located in the temple at the time. But that accusation of having a demon, we see that all down through history. We see it here in the pages of scripture, and we see it today on social media and elsewhere. But the next reading we have is one of the most famous or infamous, of course, and that's the crowd in Pilate's courtyard. I'll just read the whole section. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted, and they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. It is not just the Pharisees, it is not just the leaders of the Jews who scream for Christ to be crucified. And we'll read another section that adds more to this as well. It is the Jews themselves, it is the crowd that screams for Barabbas, for the murderer over Christ. That cannot be avoided, and we are not permitted to minimize that. That is what Scripture says. That is what we are required to believe. 
You don't subtract from Scripture, you don't add to Scripture. Revelation is very clear about the warning for those who would do either of those things. And it is worth especially noting, Pilate tries repeatedly to free Christ. Pilate asks multiple times why they want to kill Christ. He picks Barabbas as the option. Because do note that Pilate is the one who selects Barabbas. Pilate doesn't just select a prisoner at random. He doesn't say, would you like me to free any prisoner? He says, would you like this murderous rebel, who is probably going to go out and murder someone the same day he's released, or do you want Christ? He stacks the deck as much as he possibly can to try to free Christ. The crowd will have none of it. The crowd wants his blood. And I think that's the chief reason that we focus so much on pastors and teachers, because the crowd was doing what they had been taught, but the crowd did it. The Pharisees and the high priests absolutely ginned up hatred against Christ, just as we see today. We see church leaders on our own day ginning up hatred against men, seeking their murder. And people go along with it. People will happily go along with it because you know what? When your church leader stands up and said, this man is a Nazi, he needs to be thrown out and destroyed, he needs to be killed, who's going to argue? Nobody likes that. And so it's very easy for the crowd to go along. God doesn't care what your station is. Whether you were the leader or you were someone at the very bottom in the crowd, just a nameless face, if your voice speaks in opposition to that which is godly, you are guilty of the same murder as everyone else. In John 5, it's written, the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father making himself equal with God. In the beginning of John 7, it says, After this, Jesus went about to Galilee. He would not go into Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. And then later in John 7, he says, Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. I think that's an interesting passage because it was the crowd that wanted Jesus dead, and it was the Pharisees and the chief priests who responded to the demand. See, we're always told that, oh, it was the, it was the chief priests that were the gang leaders. It was a team effort the, because the chief priests and the Pharisees, they had their own agenda, and it was a wicked one, but they often followed the lead of the crowd. The crowd of what? The crowd of Jews. Not every Jew, because obviously when Jesus went around in Galilee, he was with Jews. He was with his disciples. They were Jews. It wasn't all of them, but it was a small minority who were faithful. The rest were either confused or they were murderous. And the confused he'd preach to, and the murderous he typically fled. He would go to a place and speak for a little while, and then he would disappear because they were trying to murder him continuously for three years. I mean, it's, it's like a Benny Hill skit where you have a, you know, like three times speed and somebody's just running back and forth across the screen and you have the crowd chasing and waving pitchforks and torches. That was basically Jesus' ministry. He would go and do something miraculous and preach something wonderful and then everyone tried to murder him and he had to flee with the few followers he had that he could trust not to try to murder him. That was his entire life as Jesus, the, the minister to his people. And for three and a half years, he did that. And finally, God permitted them to fulfill their murderous goal because it was also God's goal. Their evil, what they meant for evil, God intended for good. God used the evil of the Jews. He used the cowardice of Pilate, who knew that he was doing something wrong, but he didn't want to take the political risk. So he stacked the deck and then let the chips fall where they may. God used all of those failings to pour out the punishment for our sins on Jesus on the cross. All this was done for our benefit. And that doesn't change the fact that all of it was evil when it was happening. To add to the narrative of the Jews in Pilate's courtyard, Pilate at least twice in this narrative says that he will punish Christ and then release him. 
he is attempting to appease the Jews by punishing Christ, but attempting not to have this innocent man's blood on his hands, and yes, he does wash his hands of the matter, by releasing Christ. And so from Luke 23, When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean, and when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him, and Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then, arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day, for before this they had been at enmity with each other. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I do not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. So again, you see in this narrative, Pilate is attempting to do anything he can to not kill Christ, to not have to deal with this issue. He sends him over to Herod, hoping that Herod will be able to deal with it. And so Christ stands before a Jewish ruler, accused by the Jews standing by. And so they treat him shamefully and send him back. After mocking him, send him back to Pilate. Pilate again tries to not have to crucify Christ. He says, I will punish the man and then release him. And then to continue reading, but they all cried out together, Away with this man, and release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, Crucify, crucify him. A third time he said to them, Why, what evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. Scripture is very clear. Again, it says that Pilate desires to release Jesus, but the crowd, the Jews, want him crucified. And more than that, because of course we have from Matthew, in Matthew 27, and all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. That is in response to Pilate saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. The Jews call down a generational curse for Christ's blood on themselves, on themselves and on their children. That is what Scripture says. So Christians are not, again, Christians are not permitted to minimize what Scripture says about the guilt and the evil of the Jews. That does not mean they can't be Christian, because of course they can repent. Even crucifying Christ isn't the unforgivable sin. However, being impenitent is unforgivable. And the Jews, by and large, are impenitent. Ask them today. You will see, even just go on social media and search for it. There are many of them who will say, if Christ came back, we'd crucify him again. To this day, they are proud of what they did in Pilate's courtyard. Now again, that does not apply to those who have repented, who have converted, who have ceased to be Jews and become Christians, because that, is what, that in this case, is what it takes. You have to cease to be a Jew to be a Christian. But many of them are proud of what their ancestors did. That's the generational curse. His blood on those in that courtyard and on their children. That is the word of God. That is what scripture says. That is what Christians are required to believe. And it's, of course, the most ironic blasphemy imaginable because we too pray for Christ's blood to be upon us and upon our children. But from the complete opposite direction, we wish to receive the forgiveness of sins found in that blood. They had nothing but contempt for it, and they have nothing but contempt for it to this day. So the blood of Christ is upon everyone, 
but it doesn't mean the same thing. When the blood of Christ is upon the elect, it is for their salvation. When the blood of Christ is upon those who despise him, it is for their eternal damnation, which is tragic. And I think that we'll get into it in a future episode, but I think it's worth noting that today you have the Zionists and you have the John Hagees and even the Pope himself in the 60s effectively saying, we don't need to evangelize the Jews, they're just fine the way they are. Not only is that blasphemy, not only is it absolutely false doctrine, but it's the worst possible thing for the Jews. If you hate Jews, then yeah, leave them alone. Don't tell them about God. If you hate Jews and want to see them burning in in eternity, then just let them be, because that's the track that they're on. The only loving thing that can be possibly done for this group of people is to bring the gospel to them. Something, incidentally, is illegal in Israel. You'll be deported if you try to do that. And that spirit is, is exemplified after Christ's crucifixion. I think it's important, like we said, part of the reason we're talking about this particular thing is that there are many pastors who are afraid to say this stuff from the pulpit or in Bible study. They want to hem and haw and try to deflect blame from the crowd of Jews to the small group of people. Listen to the preaching of Peter in Acts 3. While he clung to Peter and John and all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us? As though by our own power or piety, we have made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate, when he had decided to release him. But you denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. In his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. In the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that as Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back. This is everything that the Corey and I just said. Peter, as soon as he gets us and preaches, he doesn't say it was the Pharisees that did it. He doesn't say, your rulers are bad, that you're all right. He says, men of Israel, you murdered God. And he also offers forgiveness. He says, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. As Corey just said, it wasn't the unforgivable sin. Even murdering God on the cross was not unforgivable. And yet they continued, it by and large, to persist in their evil. That is what the law and the gospel are for. You must deliver to a lot of those who are impenitent in their sins. Peter was looking at this crowd of Jews and saying, you murdered Christ, you must repent of this. He wasn't begging them, but that was, that was it. You murdered Christ. What possibly could be more horrific to a believer than to hear that? And that's precisely why he told them. When we have pastors today and we have leaders and we have teachers who are afraid to say that, what happens to the Christian faith when we become so ashamed of it that we have to hide it in a corner and we can't proclaim it in its fullness as Scripture itself proclaims it? We don't get a vote on this stuff. We don't get to say it was the Pharisees, it wasn't the crowds. We don't get to just blame the crowds either because there are numerous passages that say that the Pharisees, the rulers, the high priests conspired off on their own Everyone was guilty, and everyone had the opportunity to be forgiven. God says it, we have to say it. We have to say it about the Jews, and we have to say it about the Jews today. And the fact that today, when you say the Jews, people get really nervous, and suddenly pastors have to get up in the pulpit. I've actually heard pastors change the text to avoid saying the Jews. They will say the Pharisees or some other thing to deflect blame to that one little outgroup to blame the leaders, to blame the president of the synod. It's not that guy. It's everyone who's listening. It's everyone who's following evil that is equally evil. You don't get an out because you're not senior. The only out is forgiveness through repentance. And in case anyone thinks that we are going beyond the bounds of the evidence, as it were, in our comments about what the Jews believe today, I will read for you in English translation 
a prayer from the Talmud. This one is from the Jerusalem version instead of the Babylonian, but they are nearly identical. The Jews traditionally pray three times per day. This is the Berkat Haminim, and here is the prayer in English. For the apostates, let there be no hope, and uproot the kingdom of arrogance, speedily and in our days. May the Nazarenes and the sectarians perish as in a moment. Let them be blotted out of the book of life, and not be written together with the righteous. You are praised, O Lord, who subdues the arrogant. You are a Nazarene, if you're a Christian. That's what that means. Traditionally, and still today, Jews pray three times per day, cursing you specifically because you are a Christian. That is something they've been doing for centuries. That is something, again, they still do today. This was something they hid for a very long time. But then, I believe it was originally a German academic who got a hold of a copy of some of these documents and started translating them. And as the Talmud has been translated, we've found more and worse things. And I'm sure at some point we will go over the Talmud in greater depth. But this is the mindset of modern Jews. They hate Christians. And incidentally, when they're talking about apostates, they are cursing Jews who have converted to Christianity. They hold a particular hatred for Jews who convert. But they hate Christians. And they pray and curse you multiple times per day. Now, of course, they are not praying to the Lord God, because those who do not have the Son do not have the Father. And they reject the Son, so they are not praying to God the Father. That is an important point. There are many pastors and others who will say, well, no, the, the Jews worship God, they just don't worship him correctly. No. Scripture says that those who do not have the Son do not have the Father. The Jews do not worship the Lord God. They do not worship the Father. They do not worship the Trinity. They are not in any way, shape, or form related to Christians or Christianity. They are vile pagans, and they pray to curse you three times per day, at least. There are other prayers they say that are daily prayers that also call down curses. That Their is the reality of the situation. Yes, exactly. Their prayers are to Satan. They are praying to Satan to curse you. There are so many pastors and leaders and others who are afraid to say these things. But this is the reality. This is exactly what their own holy books say, so-called holy books. And this is just grazing the surface. Incidentally, Christ responds to the Talmud in Scripture. One of the most abused passages in Scripture is in part a response to a wicked Jewish prayer from proto-versions of the Talmud, because one of the prayers that is said by Jewish men traditionally, at least once per day, sometimes multiple times per day, is a prayer that basically says, thank you to God that I was not made a Gentile. Thank you to God that I was not made a woman. And so, you should be thinking of Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is not male and female. Well, they also add to their prayer that, thank you, God, for not making me a slave. Well, there are the three categories that Christ uses right there in a Jewish prayer. He is responding in part to the evil of the Talmud as it is taking form because it was not finished until around the 500s, perhaps a little earlier, but right around that time. But some of the materials were obviously coalescing at the time of Christ's ministry. So Christians should have some familiarity with these things, because it is responded to in our own holy documents, in Scripture. This is not just some esoteric issue that's off on the sidelines. This is of the utmost importance because this deals with a very real, very live controversy in our time. And the reason for pointing these things out in time is that none of these are flukes. It wasn't a fluke that they just happened to be really mean in the year that Jesus was ministering. And it doesn't so happen that they just happen to be really mean you know, when they wrote those prayers, or that they're really mean today. 1 Thessalonians 2 says, For you, brothers, became imitators of the church of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. 
For you suffer the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and drove us out and displeased God and oppose all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them at last. This is Paul writing to a Greek city, but he's talking not only about the murder of Christ, but how the Jews have been murdering prophets for centuries. This was not new behavior for them. God kept sending prophets, and they kept getting killed or ignored. You know, prophet, being selected as a prophet is never good news. <laughs> it never went, ends well. I mean, the, I think the one who got off the best was Elijah. He, he didn't die. He was just taken up in a whirlwind or on a chariot. He wasn't. He didn't have to suffer as many others did in death, but his life was no bowl of roses. It, I think it's important to hearken back to something that we have mentioned on previous episodes. We didn't mention we were talking about the Old Testament today. When Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, they were in the desert. He went up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments from God. He was gone for 40 days. He, he, that was when he received the books. He was up there for 40 days. There was a pillar of fire at night and pillar of smoke during the day. It was a huge scene. It was very visible. The Israelites were down at the base of the mountain. In the 40 days that Moses was up there, they descended into idolatry. They had Aaron melt down their gold and make a golden calf for them, which was, as, as Corey has said previously, was almost certainly one of the gods of Egypt that they chose to worship. And they said, Aaron, make a god for us. Make the god that led us out of Egypt. God's right there on the mountain. God's in a pillar of fire talking to Moses, talking to the prophet who led them out of captivity. And what do they do? They turn their back on him and say, no, we want to makeshift God. We're going to worship this instead. And they did. Moses comes down, and they're having a big party worshiping pagan gods. In they just left Egypt. They'd just seen all of these miracles. They're, be they're before a miracle with the physical special presence of God through the fire and the smoke, and they apostatize. This was the spirit of these people. So I think one of the key things to understand about the Jewish period of time in Scripture is that I, I think a good analog for it is a message in a bottle. The gospel was given to Adam in the garden, Genesis 3.15. There was a promise made that God was going to fix this. That was expanded upon in future generations. When the day came that God came to Abraham and made the special promise to him and then wrestled with Jacob and named him Israel, and then when Moses was given the books of God, something changed. What changed was that what had been a broadly defined promise became much more narrowly defined in terms of additional promises were being made. A covenant was specifically made with Abraham and was renewed with his descendants. And I think that in some ways that covenant and the laws, the Levitical laws in particular, were like the bottle. You know, you throw a message in the bottle and you throw it in the ocean, it's going to bob away and then get somewhere. The function that the Levitical laws or that the, the ceremonial laws had for the Israelites is that it made them weird. They had to do weird stuff with their clothing and with their food and with their, their appearance. They weren't going to be permitted to mix with their neighbors because God knew that every time his people mixed with their pagan neighbors, they became pagan. There was an, it didn't work the other way. It should have worked the other way, but they were not faithful. And so any exposure to foreign gods caused them to whore after foreign gods. That's how God describes it as whoring. And that's what it is. It's spiritual lust after that which is forbidden, which is a cheap imitation. But people's passions get inflamed and they chase that which is fake and they turn their back on that which is real. And so God knew this. And so he wrapped them in this bottle of these Levitical laws that said you have to do this with your beard and you can't eat these foods and you can't sow your grains like this. And the isolation that that caused from them relative to their neighbors helped to preserve the message. 
which was the gospel. It was the word of God, and it was the promises of the Messiah that were to be preserved through the people as well as through the bloodline. And so the word that was basically their DNA, the ACTG in their genes, that would be passed down to Jesus in the flesh, that was from Abraham's seed. And there was also the word, the spoken word, the promises of God were also passed. And that was the function that the Jews served for 2,000 years. Now, for 2,000 years, there were no Jews. And then for 2,000 years, from Abraham to Jesus, the Jews were in varying states of evolution, preserving these messages from God, so that in the day when the Messiah came and fulfilled the prophecies, everyone would know. They would have a list, and they would have been studying and looking for it and being excited to see it come, so that when a man appears and heals the blind and the lame, you rejoice, and you say, at last the Messiah has come. That was the purpose. They did everything in their power to fail that purpose, and yet God preserved them for his ends, because they were chosen not to be special in some sense of its own, but to be the vessel that would preserve these promises until they were fulfilled. And one of the things that's emphasized repeatedly, particularly in Paul's epistles, is because the promises had been given to the Jews, they knew about them. Paul's very clear that when there's no knowledge, sin does not attach in the same way as when there's knowledge. And so the urgency of reaching the Jews with the gospel, especially in his day, was but they had become apostate. When the prophecies were not yet fulfilled, they could hope in their future fulfillment. But now that they had been fulfilled, it was urgent that the Jews would be told, the prophecies are fulfilled, the Messiah has come, and he has died and he is living again. It was urgent for them to hear that because they were now under condemnation for refusing to believe. That's a fundamentally different thing than the the Greek or the Roman or the Ugandan or the Indian who's never heard any of this stuff. He's not in the same spiritual state as these, as these people who for hundreds and thousands of years had been told these stories, who'd been given these promises, because the promises were made to them and through them for all. When Jesus came and fulfilled them, and then they rejected them and said, his blood be on us and our children. That was the worst possible thing for them. And part of Paul's urgency to reach the Jews was to try to save them from their own wickedness, just as Peter did in this sermon, where he said, you unknowingly did this, repent, because when they die, that's it. There's there, We get to read the book today that says, here's what happened bad 2,000 years ago. It wasn't written yet. They were living it. And so they had the choice in their lifetime, do I believe in the promise that God has fulfilled, or do I continue in my hatred of those promises? It might not have been hatred before Christ came, but once he came, that was the proof of who was elect and who was faithless. And so on the topic of the Jews and whether or not they can convert to be Christian, we should, of course, read Romans 9 the words of Paul here, the words of the Holy Spirit, spoken, written through Paul. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, And to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But... Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, About this time next year I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born, and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue. 
not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told. The older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. I think that ties back perfectly into the the election episode that we mentioned earlier. Again, it's it's really an important one to understand this and many of the other things we say a lot of a lot of what is misunderstood in 21st century Christian theology is the result of a bad understanding of election. We don't take it seriously. We don't we don't think it means anything. And neither did the Jews. I mean, that was part of the problem. They thought that being lineal sons of Abraham was all it took that and obeying the law. You, know, you keep the law and you're a child of Abraham and you're in, and everyone else is out no matter what. That's not what God said. It was never what God promised. And so as we look at these things, it's just important to remember how God speaks. He talks about them being important for these purposes, but it wasn't, they were not a purpose unto themselves. The Jews didn't exist for the sake of the Jews. They do today. And frankly, in most times in history, they did. The few glory days that Israel had were the few days when they were being faithful. It wasn't much. He had a period under David, a period under Solomon, and (laughs) precious few other times where there were really glory periods. The rest was punishment from God for faithlessness. I want to end here with a passage from John 8 that um, it comes up every year when Easter rolls around because it's something that the Jews to this day explicitly condemn. Whenever you hear a Jew talking about Christianity, they will bring up John, John 8, particularly John 8, 44, but I'm going to read the whole passage to put it in context. We're going to talk next week about some of the early church fathers and some of the quotes and sermons that are called anti-Semitic, where, where the notion arose that you know, that, that's basically a, a term of blasphemy, to say you are blaspheming against something. And you know, when something is called anti-Semitic, you're saying you're blaspheming the Jews. Well, that is a religion. To, to have that sort of blasphemy law is indeed a religion, but it's not the Christian religion. A Christian can only blaspheme God. We can't blaspheme anything else. Now, there are ways that we can blaspheme God that don't necessarily involve that which is overt. So I'm not trying to draw a fuzzy line here where there's a clear one, but we don't get to speak in ways that God doesn't speak. So I'm going to read this passage from John 8 to close, because it's one that's despised, and it's one that frankly makes Christians uncomfortable this day. And that really concerns us. I mean, that's why Stone Choir exists. If there's a passage in Scripture that you can read to Christians, and Christians start squirming, you have a problem. Forget anybody else in the world, forget any other opinions you might have, if you are uncomfortable about something in Scripture, you have a spiritual problem. So John 8, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it you say you will become free? Jesus answers them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever, the son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me, because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, We are not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. 
Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin if I tell the truth? Why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. This is a profound passage because Jesus is speaking directly to a crowd of Jews and he's telling them, you are Satan's children. You are deaf to my voice because you were born of the father of lies. Even as they stand there and they make claims of lineage and claims of being sons of Abraham and claims of righteousness, he says you have none of those things. You do not do Abraham's works because you do not have Abraham's faith, which was the root of election. Abraham had faith, and it was counted to him as righteousness. The circumcision came after. The circumcision was not what made him righteous. He was circumcised because he was righteous. He was righteous, and therefore he obeyed God. The order of operations matters. And Jesus understood that Jesus is God. As he said, when he came to him and he did his father's things and they hated it, it's because they are of their father. When there is a man today, whether it's 2,000 years ago or today, when a man hates the things of God, that man is of Satan. It's not all Jews today. There are a few Jews who actually become Christian and cease to be Jews. And there are many who are not Jews who are enemies of God today. And today in our own churches, we have these same Jews. They don't go by the name Jew, but they hate God just as much. They will thump their genealogy. It won't be the genealogy of Abraham. It will be the genealogy of some confession, a confession which points God faithfully, but they will ignore that part. They will just use whatever they can as an anchor to make themselves a participant in something where they are not participants. You can only participate in God's things if you are God's child, and you're only his child by adoption through faith. Those who do not have faith are not adopted sons of God. They remain children of Satan. And so as you see people in the world reacting to God's things, many times in this preaching, whether it's from Jesus or Peter or Paul or any other man, when they preach, some of the people were confused. They, it wasn't ignorant confusion. It wasn't a confusion born of a lack of faith. They were hearing something for the first time and they didn't know what to make of it. That's okay. That There's hope for that man. Some believed immediately. Some all already believed. Those are saved. The rest, and frankly the majority, in Jesus' day and in our day, hear the things of God and they react by saying, you have a demon, you are evil. There's no middle ground when you're dealing with people who are possessed by the devil. They know when they're dealing with the Son of God, and their reactions are violent. They're filled with hatred. We should expect that when we are faithful to God, there will be times when it elicits those same responses. That is not that there's been some miscommunication. It's not that we should have been more winsome, we should have been nicer. It's not that if we'd only used different words, they would understand. It's that we are of our Father in heaven, and they are of their Father the devil. You will face this in your lives if you're faithful Christians. If you just if you hide and, and try to ride it out, it's not going to work, but you'll, you'll learn that the hard way. You are going to have to take a stand for Christ, and there, there will be days when that hurts. There will be days where you suffer for it, and you are hated to your face, because that is the state that the world is in. The father of lies, the father of Jews, is running the show today. There's not much left of the faithful remnant. It exists, and it will always exist, but only because God promised it, and God will preserve it. God will preserve his people. Everyone else is going to try to kill us. That's good news. It means that we're on the right side. It means that we are on God's side, and God is on our side. That's the thing that we have to worry about. So don't be afraid of topics that seem scary. Be afraid of the fact that a topic that seems scary is scary in the first place because it shouldn't be. The truth should not scare Christians. When someone's afraid of the truth, that person has a bigger problem. And we've said before, these are not problems that a podcast can solve. You need to spend time in the Word. 
you need to spend time studying scripture and contemplating and meditating on these things and be aware in your life, not just on Sunday, not just in Bible class, be aware every day of where you're seeing these things playing out. And you will find that there's a spiritual tenor to things that don't necessarily have a spiritual context. Your workplace is going to have a spiritual tenor to things where maybe 20 years ago it didn't, or if it did, it wasn't at all obvious. Today it's going to be obvious. This is where the battleground is, and this is where we will prove ourselves to either be faithful children of God or to be sons of Satan. As Christians, we have only one choice, and as we see others respond, we see them choosing as well. All these sermons that were delivered in the, Old, in the New Testament served a winnowing function. Many wandered away from Jesus preaching upset or confused or angry. A few stuck around because they believed. The same math is going to work out today. Be one of the few who sticks around and believes in God, because on the last day, he is going to welcome each of us. And so I want to close out this episode by going over a seemingly minor technical matter, but something that is really at the foundation of all of this for this series of episodes and many of the others as well. And that is the word concept fallacy. This is really, in a sense, related to the idea of essence and accident. Those who understand those terms can tie that together. I won't go over that bit. But the word concept fallacy has two essential forms. The first one is that you believe you've studied a word and therefore you understand the concept. That's a fallacy. You can study a word without understanding the concept to which it refers. But the second one, and perhaps the more important one here, is the conflation of the two things. The conflation of the word that symbolizes the concept and the concept itself. That is what we have happening in many of these issues. For instance, with the term Jew, there are those who will use the term and then conflate it with the concept, and there are several different concepts it covers. You could be Jewish by blood, you could be Jewish by religion, those are not the same thing. If you conflate those and then say the term always refers to one or the other or both, you are running afoul of this fallacy. You are committing this error. And so it is important to understand the sense in which the terms are being used, but perhaps more relevant to us as Christians and more in our own backyard for instance, if you are holding a Bible and the Book of Concord, that doesn't make you a Lutheran. If you just say that, well, I have these and I believe them, that still doesn't make you a Lutheran. If you believe them, that makes you a Lutheran. Now, some will have brought to mind the idea of, well, that's no true Scotsman fallacy, but it's not. And that's where that accident and essence issue comes in. There are things that you are essentially, and there are things that you are not essentially. They can change. If you are male, you are essentially male. That cannot change. You aren't male because you believe you're male. You aren't male because you call yourself male. You aren't male because you put pronouns at the end of your email signature. That's not how that works. That is something you are essentially. The same is true of your race. If you are German, you are German because your parents were German. If you are English, you are English because your parents were English. The same for any race. That is something you are essentially. You are not essentially a Christian because you may not have been a Christian as a child. You could apostatize. That can change, and therefore it is not in this sense of the term essential. And so... When you are dealing with the no true Scotsman issue, that only applies to things that are essential. And that's why it's no true Scotsman, because that is race, that is blood. You cannot change that. And so if you say no true Scotsman would wear pink and you find a Scotsman by blood who's wearing pink, well, you can't just say, well, no true Scotsman, because you found a true Scotsman who's wearing pink. Now, there are other issues here. There's some nuance I could go into, but we'll leave that aside for now. The issue here 
is that when you, when you are dealing with Christianity, when you are dealing with religion, when you're dealing with a confession or a political party, anything like that, these things have tenets. They have doctrines. They have things they profess, things they assert that are true. If you believe those things, you belong to that group because that is what defines the group. Being a Scotsman is defined by blood, not by what color you wear or which pattern you wear, whatever it happens to be. That is not the case with Christianity. To be a Christian, you must believe the things that Scripture teaches. That is what it means to be a Christian. A Christian has faith in Christ, in the saving blood of Christ, in his atonement, in his sacrifice. That is what it means to be a Christian. Being a Christian does not mean holding up the Bible and waving it at people. That doesn't make you a Christian. Being a Lutheran doesn't mean holding up the Book of Concord and waving it at people. Being Reformed doesn't mean holding up the Westminster Confession and waving it at people. Whichever group it is, you have to actually believe the contents of that book. And so if someone tells you, well, of course I'm X, of course I'm this kind of Christian. Look, I have the collar and the book, and that's not what it means. What does he actually believe? What does he actually teach? What does he do in his life? It is the same thing with the Jews. There are Jews who can convert to Christianity and no longer be a Jew and be Christian. There are Christians who can be apostate in everything they do and still claim to be Christian. Simply labeling yourself with the term does not make you the thing. One would think that Christians living in an era when we have men claiming to be women and women claiming to be men and people claiming to be dogs and whatever else is happening out there, one would think it would be obvious that simply claiming to be a thing does not make you the thing. And yet pastors and many others constantly get away with doing so. Do not let them get away with it. Simply claiming that you are X does not make you X. Simply claiming that you are Christian does not make you Christian. Being a Christian means believing the word of God, trusting in Christ as your Lord and Savior. And yes, it does re also mean rejecting the various teachings of the devil. That is why as Lutherans, for instance, in our confirmation oath, we reject the devil and all his works and all his ways. Because that is part of what it means to be a Christian. And so when the Jews told Christ, we're descended from Abraham, we've never been slaves, of course we're saved, of course we're elect. That's not what it means. That's why in Romans it says, not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Those are two different things. The first is the essential, that's race, descended from Israel. The second is belong to Israel. That's Christians, that's the church. You can be descended from Israel by blood and not belong to Israel, the church, by faith. You can belong to Israel, the church, by faith, and not be descended from Israel, the man, by blood. Being a Christian is a matter of faith. That is the core of what we believe. That is why we call it a faith. Believe the words of God as they are written in his book. Don't water them down for the world. Don't ignore them because they're uncomfortable. Don't start editing the scripture because it makes you uncomfortable or it makes your life more difficult. As Christians, we are called to proclaim the truth in season and out of season. And that is, in fact, regardless of the consequences. Yes, we may apply wisdom to these things, but we do not get to deny the truth. Because denying God's truth is denying Christ before men. And we know what Christ says about that. We as Christians are going to spend eternity with Adam and with Noah and with Abraham and with Moses and with Elijah and with Jesus. We're going to spend eternity with them because they were Christian. They are Christian. We are Christian. The essence of the Christian faith is belief in the gospel, belief in the promise of the Messiah. Those who lived before the Messiah believed in the promise as it was yet to be fulfilled those who lived in Christ's day believed in the promise of the Messiah as they witnessed its fulfillment. And we who live 2,000 years after the fulfillment of the Messiah's promise 
believe it in retrospect. We believe that which has been fulfilled and transmitted to us through time. And in eternity, we will all be united as Christians because every single person in heaven, every single person who will be in the new earth is a Christian. In essence, the essence of the Christian faith is belief in the Messiah who has delivered the eternal life to us. Every man in faith in heaven believed that and received it. That is how the Christian faith works. Amen.